që ku është nëruar mirë nama dhe mirë se ardhët në emisioni mbetimi për drejtësi. Krimet e pas bardurat të regjimit të Miloševicit të kryera me luftën e fundit në Kosovë vazhdojnë të mbesin brengë e shoqëris. Viktimat e krimit vazhdojnë të kërkojnë drejtësi ndërsa sistemi i drejtësis endë nuk e ka kryer punën për të hetuar ndjekur dhe gjykuar kryesit e krimeve të luftës, të cilat janë kryer nga regjimi i Miloševicit. Son të kemi vendosur të trajtojmë temën e krimeve të luftës në Kosovë. Jo në tërsi si tem, sepse është shumë e gjerë, por do të trajtojmë periudhën e trajtimit të rasteve të krimeve të luftës nga misioni i EULEXIT në Kosovë. Sa lënd të krimeve të luftës i ka pranuar EULEXIT nga unë miku, si janë pranuar këto lënd. Sa lënd për krime luftë i ka trajtuar EULEXIT, sa prej tyre janë hetuar, sa këta kuza janë ngritur, sa këtë gjykime kanë përfunduar me akë gjykim përfundimtar, sa prej të akuzuarve kanë qenë të nacionalitetit shqiptar, sërb dhe të tjerë, sa prej të denuarve kanë qenë të nacionalitetit shqiptar, sërb dhe të tjerë. Si ka mundësi që ka një diskrepans ka që të madhe në mes të sërbëve dhe shqiptarëve që janë akuzuar dhe gjykuar për krime luftën Kosovë, duke pas parasysh se qëfar ka ndodur në luftën e Kosovës, duke ditur se kush ka qenë agresori dhe kush ka qenë viktima. Cilat janë sfidat në trajtimin e rasteve të krimeve të luftës? Sa rastet krimeve të luftës i ka ndërzuar tek autoritetet vendore e u leksi dhe kur i ka ndërzuar ato? Për gjitha këto dhe më shumë rrët trajtimit e rasteve të krimeve të luftës, bënë shet i zyres për të drejtat e njeriut dhe qështje ligjore në e u leks të cilën e ka zhvilluar kolegu e hatë miftaraj. Mr. Flun, welcome to our TV show, Betimi për Drejtësi. We're very happy and glad and thank you for participating in our TV show. Today we will discuss mainly with regard to the mission or mandate of the ULEX mission since its establishment back in 2008 with special focus with regard to the war crimes. So in this regard, I will start uh, the first question. After the completion of the mission of ANMIC in Kosovo, the number of cases has been transferred to ULEX. So could you provide us with some explanation how these cases has been transferred from ANMIC to ULEX with special focus with regard to the war crime cases? Yes. Um, as you know, ANMIC had been dealing with a lot of cases up to 2008. Uh, when ULEX took over from ANMIC, uh, the ANMIC transferred to them in hard copy and in some cases digitally um, some 1,200 war crimes cases um, that had not been worked on at that time and that had been pending before the, ULEX, the ANMIC prosecutors. It also handed over some 90 odd cases. Um, which were ongoing with UNMIC at the time. In addition to this, it handed over a large consignment of missing person files. Um, approximately 5,000 files were handed over by UNMIC to ULEX. And ultimately, when ULEX did a review on those files, it was found that uh, 3,000 of those files had been closed, 2,000 of them were still open and active. By closed, I mean that yeah. uh, the bodies have been rec recovered. Is there any track rec record, for example, for this case that has been received? You said that some of them has been received in hard copy, some of them electron electronically. So is there any track record, some minutes of receiving such cases? Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have access to all of the records uh, because those, those records are being held by IFM. Um, but there would have been receipts signed between, uh, the, firstly, there was an agreement, a number of agreements signed between UNMIC and ULEX, recording the transfer of files, yeah. formally recording the transfer of files. So in that respect, there would be those records there, and then there would be receipts for the files uh, as they were gradually handed over. One such receiving of files, as you mentioned, that are recorded can be, for example, accessible for the public. Or such, uh, if let's say after five or ten years, public in Kosovo wants to understand how such case files have been received, do you think that it might be possible that that to be public? 
Um, well, ongoing files would not be public at this time. Exactly. Um, so uh, that, that would be immediately ruled out. As regards the 3,000 closed case files, um, application can be made to the IFM for information on those regards, yeah. and it will be a matter of, uh, as to whether the information will be released will be in accordance with the local law. Yeah. Do you have information, for example, if any left cases has been left to ANMIC and that not, has not been transferred to ULEX? Because in public there were some kind of information that there are some cases still in ANMIC in some containers which has ne never been transmitted or transferred to ULEX. Do you have I such information? I have no such information, no information. available, no. I mean, as far as we are concerned, ANMIC transferred the case, yeah. what cases it possessed to us. Yes. When these cases have been transferred, especially uh, war crimes cases, did, do we have any track record or any information, for example, at which stage of procedure such cases has been transferred from ANMIC, for example? Only criminal reports, any case which was more in advanced criminal procedure, or? Well, the hard copies of the file would have been transferred to us. So it would have required the, um, the uh, ULIX prosecutors to review, and I'll tell you about that later, to review each particular file to see the status. We were transferred at the same time a um, uh, digital database by UNMIC, which was a type of case management system yeah. which um, would show the status of the case. Um, but we, we did find that uh, not every single case was kept up to date, but generally speaking it was up to date. So in consulting it, you would see where the case was. Was it at investigation stage? Was it at trial stage? Okay. Was it at pre-investigation stage? Okay. But it, uh, it would have required, anyway, a review of each individual file. Yeah. When this case has been handed over to you, Lex, I'm speaking back in 2008, 2009, did the ULEX mission at that time had enough human resources, capacities, to treat all these cases that has been received from ANMIC? When the files were handed over to ULEX, ULEX had great expectations, and I think people had great expectations of ULEX. Um, it felt that it had the resources capable to, to, to handle the number of files. However, I don't believe that it um, was aware of the actual total number of files of it that, that were going to be ultimately handed over to it and it was somewhat surprised at the end of the day by the number of files that were actually handed over. Um, initially, um, there was only one prosecutor assigned by ULEX to handle war crimes and who conducted the review of the war crimes cases. Gradually, as the years went by, uh, a substantial number of other prosecutors were assigned to the war crimes cases in an effort to try and resolve those cases and progress them. How was cooperation with local prosecutors at that time? Did the local prosecutors in SPRK were kind of part of the joint teams to investigate, prosecute war crimes cases? Not at that time, no. ULEX, from 2008 to 2014, ULEX effectively had exclusive competence to deal with, deal with war crimes cases. So at the time, at the, uh, during that period, all war crimes cases were handled solely by ULEX prosecutors. Okay. So do you have any statistics, for example, how many cases from 2008 until the ULEX handed over the last cases, even those that were ongoing, ULEX treated, for example, how many indictments and how many ju final judgments we had when the mission kind of transferred competence to local institutions? If I can refer to, to st some statistical information that I have here. Um, as far as I'm aware, ULEX judges and prosecutors, uh, ULEX judges uh, adjudicated overall some 64 odd thousand cases uh, and, and gave some six, 648 judgments in criminal cases. Uh, there were 479 of those cases which involved war crimes, corruption, organized crime, and money laundering. Um, as to war crimes solely, I don't have those statistics. Um, but I can tell you on the basis, uh, and I rely on this largely over anything else, on the basis of statistics issued by the Humanitarian Law Center um, over the period in which ULEX and, and, and UNMIC previously were dealing with war crimes cases. Um, 
And there were some 39 defendants sentenced uh, for war crimes in Kosovo. 38 of those were convicted by Ulix. And during the same period, out of 48 war crimes indictments, 22 were filed by Ulix, um, in two, in, including two you know, filed by mixed teams of Ulix and local prosecutors, okay. which I am myself worked on. Yeah. Based on those statistics, as you might see, majority of the people who have been indicted or sentenced are of Albanian ethnicity. Yes. So since you are for five years in Kosovo, you understand also what happened in <coughs> 1998, 1999, which is also in the context of the request of Kosovo people in the, in the field. Yeah. They are seek, asking why we have majority of sentenced and indicted out of Albanian majority, whereas we understand that during the war, who kind of committed more war crimes. So what kind of methodology was used by ULEX that we came, we ended up with more and more Albanians indicted and sentenced and less Serbs? It's a reasonable question, given the statistics that you have. Um, please remember that when ULEX came here, it came here from, as a, from a neutral standpoint. Um, it, the purpose of ULEX was to assist the local authorities in the prosecution of cases. We weren't replacing the judicial system, we were here to assist and, and to contribute to it. And Ulex prosecutors and judges were embedded in the Kosovo, yeah. Kosovo, Kosovo legal system. <coughs> um, at the time when we took over the files from UNMIC, there was certainly no policy in place, to my knowledge, uh, to focus on Albanian defendants. Um, largely speaking, uh, we were aware from uh, what happened with UNMIC, that there were Albanian defendants and there were people responsible from Serbian uh, ethnicity also. Um, prosecutors will follow the evidence. So in reviewing the files and finding uh, that they could work on a certain number of files, because what happened was they reviewed the, the 1,200 cases. They found that they could work on a certain number of the cases primarily because defendants were available. Largely those defendants were living here in Kosovo. Uh, we, were in, we were encountering major problems in relation to uh, cases involving uh, suspects of Serbian ethnicity because either witnesses were dead, were not available because they had fled Kosovo and were abroad in other countries, or because the suspect was had fled either to Serbia or Montenegro or some other country surrounding Kosovo. Yes, um, that indeed it was kind of problematic, but again, based on international, on the law, on international legal cooperation and criminal matters, prosecution, Ministry of Justice, they could use or issue inter international arrest warrants, which <coughs> that happened in many cases when also people have been arrested based on such international arrest warrants. But remember that when it came to Serbian defendants and those living in Serbia, those suspects who were living in Serbia, because Serbian constitution prohibited the extradition of Serbian citizens uh, to third countries. And I'm not just talking about Kosovo. Uh, and of course, you had the political connotations. Absolutely. Serbia didn't recognize Kosovo. So you were, you were effectively having ULEX as an international organization uh, dealing with Serbia and trying to reach some kind of cooperation agreement with Serbia. Yeah, absolutely. Even in the beginning when the mission, ULEX mission started in Kosovo, it was kind of technical agreement between government of Kosovo and Serbia, which was kind of facilitated with ULEX to yeah. increase kind of cooperation in mutual legal uh, assi what assistance. What was agreed was the exchange of information. Exactly. So, evidence, But there was it was never because it would have been constitutionally uh, and improper to do so. There was never any agreement by Serbia to extradite its citizens here. No, that, here, that I'm not major here I'm not speaking about extradition, but I'm speaking with regard to exchange of information because we understand that at least in public yeah. there are a lot of, do not mention rumors or information, that uh, ULEX provided a lot of information to s war crimes department in Serbia with regard to war crimes happening in Kosovo, but it seems that the same was not when it comes to exchange information from Serbia to Kosovo. Yeah. So it, it was Serbia equal partner for ULEX or it was well, one side who provided information, yeah. another side was refraining 
provide such information? Um, I can't say that there was a refusal to provide information. I know that in cases that I worked on where I made requests to Serbia for mutual legal assistance, uh, the principal war crimes prosecutor in Serbia and his deputy assistants made every es uh, effort to provide me with the information. Obviously, if there was political obstacles to it, they would not be able to overcome that. But in so far as it was possible, I do remember specifically getting, getting assistance from Serbia. Okay. But certainly, in terms of proportionality, we were providing more information to them that they were, than they were providing to us. Yeah. But certainly, the, I, uh, the, I, 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 I can say genuinely that the Serbian war crimes prosecutor was willing to give us the evidence if that yeah. was available. If I may, which, again, which are the main challenges for ULEX prosecutors, police, judges in investigating, prosecuting, adjudicating war crimes? Okay. And whether there was any kind of handover <coughs> of expertise, experience with local prosecutors? Because one of the competences of ULEX was also to transfer that knowledge, that expertise to local counterparts. Okay. Well, I'll start with your first, the, the first question was, uh, what were the main obstacles? I mean, there were numerous obstacles presented to the prosecutors dealing with cases. Uh, firstly, when the files were handed over to us by UNMIC, many of the files were in a very, very poor state. Um, there was no indexing. Many of the documents contained in the files were photocopies. You cannot use photocopy documentation in evidence in court. Uh, judges exactly. won't accept it. Um, many of the documents necessary for some reason or other were missing. Um, uh, much of the evidence, or some of the evidence, I will say, uh, some of the physical evidence uh, that un that UNMIC had in its possession wasn't handed over to 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 ULIX. So, in that respect, the case was weakened. And then there was the lack of regional cooperation from various countries surrounding Kosovo which is a major obstacle insofar as we couldn't interview Serbian witnesses or they were unwilling to assist us and so on and so forth. Um, unavailability of the defendants because they were in Serbia, they were in Montenegro or whatever. Um, unavailability of many witnesses who had gone to other countries such as the UK, Switzerland, Germany and were not willing, or not interested, nor willing to come back and give evidence. In many cases, we sent police abroad to try and gather statements. It was very difficult, very lengthy procedure, involved much delay in cases, and we were only 50% um, uh, successful in that regard. Um, what else? Then, as you know, the law changed in 2013, the, the, the Common Code of Kosovo, yeah. and the procedure was different. Many of the statements taken by witnesses on the files handed over to UNMIC had been taken uh, under the old law, law, and this meant that we now had to go through the process of having to re-interview the, interview the witnesses. And if I could take, for example, the case of Kushavogl, which yeah. I worked if on. If you and can explain also a bit about your cases that you worked. Okay. Well, in, in the Kushavogl case, as we know, was a terrible massacre committed against Albanian citizens in the south of Kosovo. Initially, there had been approximately 100 witnesses interviewed. Um, when we, it was one of the cases which was chosen to focus on, and this meant that the prosecutor at the time and his staff had to go down and re-interview almost a hundred witnesses, which took, which took over three to four months. And that evidence was put on videotape, and uh, we had that. Unfortunately, that evidence was available to us when it came to uh, being able to prosecute the case of Dr. Tasic, who was only one of the suspects. Uh, charged in the Kos in the Kushavogl case, uh, the approximately 50 defendants had there, there was a request for investigation filed against 50 defendants, and he's the only one we have managed to 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 uh, convict to capture. Um, just again, staying with the obstacles and the and the impediments, uh, the quality of the witnesses was it was also a major ob uh, um, obstacle. Many of the witnesses when it came to trial, gave different evidence than they had given in their statements. And so they were open to cross-examination by defense witness and uh, uh, created a doubt on the credibility of their evidence, and, and, and th which the judges took into effect. Um, 
there were unnecessary delays in terms of if one lawyer didn't turn up, um, it meant that the delay of the case then for another case. month and there would, there would be a delay. And also we had cases when ULEX judges or prosecutors has finished the mission and then some cases also they started from the very first beginning. And started from, from the very first, exactly. Yeah. Then there was the transitioning of investigative staff, yeah. which meant that we lost the benefit of, even though there may be a handover <coughs> from one to another, it takes time for that investigator to bring himself up to speed in the case. Yeah. Um, when it came to trials, at the end of the day, there was a certain degree of inconsistency between judges in, in how they assessed evidence. Um, when it came to appeals, when we filed an appeal, if we were unhappy with the decision, uh, instead of dealing with the appeal and making a reasoned decision, it was the policy, excuse me, policy of most of the appeal judges to send it back for retrial. So you're into a new cycle of, 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 ev of evidence. And there was also, uh, we didn't have an interactive case management system, which meant that prosecutors couldn't pick it up if they handed over from one prosecutor to another. So those, those were the main obstacles that we encountered. Um, in terms of your second question, um, what, what, uh, the degree of, of uh, transitioning to local counterparts. Um, as I say, local uh, ULIC prosecutors worked on it up to 2014. And gradually, from 2014 onwards, because ULIC prosecutors were no longer entitled to take new cases, new cases, and we knew that at the end of the day we were moving towards the closure, possibly, of the Kosovo mission, because we were only going from yeah. two years to two years, um, uh, there was a policy taken to bring on board local prosecutors local and to have interactive teams. And for example, I worked with um, the prosecutor who went to the United States. Elias Blakai? Uh, no. Elias Blakai. Elias Blakai. Yeah. I found him a tremendous prosecutor to work with. I worked with some other prosecutor, Merita, who's in the prosecution Merita office. Bina. I worked with Rita, uh, and we found them to be excellent. And um, I, I think they learned from us in terms of how we would how we, we would set up an investigation, how we would build a case, and then take it to trial. And I see the results of it. For example, in Drita Hajari, her work is tremendous. In the Darko Tasic case, she had a very difficult case to, to win, and she, she won hands down. Um, so we're very pleased at the end of the day because we felt that um, what information and, and uh, training we gave to the local prosecutors was paying off. Um, I can't speak for the judges insofar as I wasn't involved with that, yeah. but uh, what I can say is I was here as a prosecutor in the un early Unwick days, and I see the quality of judges, uh, if I compare the quality of judges from the Unwick days, local judges from Unwick days, with the quality of judges during the Unwick period, the during, during the ULEX period, yeah. it was far superior during the ULEX period. Great. We'll jump now to next phase how to say now it's for public very important to understand also how many cases has been transferred now from ULEX mm -hmm. to cost authorities as respectively to the special prosecution office do we have any statistics for example I how do. many such cases has been transferred and especially for us it's very important to understand the procedure that has been followed in transferring these cases whether again has been transferred electronically hard copy or there is any minutes in which, for example, the public might receive information that on 1st January 2015, SPRK received 1,000 cases from ULEX, out of which 20 criminal reports, 50 cases in investigation phase, 70, for example, in trial. Um, the, only thing will, the, only thing available to us is, uh, the only thing available to the public is the statistical information. Exactly. I mean stat given. statistically. We're not speaking about names or anything. Just yeah. we're not to, to know the statistics in order, for example, for us to compare the efficiency, commitment of our institutions in treating such cases. Well, in preparing for this, I only have the general statistics available to you as to uh, the handovers. I myself was in charge in coordinating the handover of the prosecution files. And so uh, according to the statistics available to us, um, ULIX handed over 
by December 2018. Um, 495 organized crime police case files. Those were handed over yeah. by the police. Police, yeah. um, 434 war crimes police case files. Police case files. Yeah. Uh, including missing persons case files. The judicial files were handed over also. I don't have the statistics of those that didn't involve. And then when it came to prosecutorial case files, I can tell you that 1,400 prosecutorial case files were handed over. In terms of the prosecutorial case files, um, there was full risk assessment done in relation to each one. So it was and made full risk assessment? Full risk assessment, every single one of them. Um, before we decided to hand it over. Um, and the case file involved preparing a handover <coughs> note, doing translations, um, a full assessment of the case. The handover note would tell the local prosecutor which, whatever local prosecutor the case was being assigned to, what the case was about, uh, the relevant details of the case, the status of the case, and uh, would make certain recommendations if the case had not been finished. Or if it was too, well, if, if it had been appealed, it was go back for retrial. How do you comment the critics that are coming from Kosovo public with regard to the treatment of war crimes cases? We are speaking again, 21 years after the war, and still kind of people they do not see that justice prevailed in majority of war crime cases. Yeah. Well, I mean, it goes back to what I said earlier. Um, I, I can understand the concern expressed by individuals and many people have criticized ULEX um, for the numbers of cases that have been dealt with since ULEX came on board. Um, but as, as I explained to you, uh, the ULEX prosecutors and judges were confronted with major obstacles which they tried to overcome. And I mean, all we can offer is the excuse that we tried to overcome those with the resources and capacity Within, within the means and capacity available to us. Um, please remember that um, when you look stick on this, there was great expectation, both by ULEX and by the locals. However, um, when you have expectations, that, that expectation must be proportionate and reasonable. And uh, I mean, case law will tell you, if you look at the ECHR, case law will tell you that to be reasonable and proportionate you must look at the facts and the manner in which the cases were being dealt with. And if you look at the facts available to us and take the history of the way and the manner in which the cases were available and the obstacles that were presented to us, um, I think that it, it, is, it would be unreasonable to expect ULEX to conduct more than it actually conducted in terms or finalized more than it actually finalized. What, the what, wish were yeah. it would be able to do more, but it wasn't. Yeah. What would you be your advice for Kosovo authorities to how to treat or what kind of approach to take in order kind of to make satisfaction our public? Because again, it's very hard, for example, if you're a victim or family member of the war crime victim and 21 years later still do not have any response for all those murders that happened. Yeah. Uh, I, I think if, the, if, if the, the, our local counterparts were to look at the Kosovo uh, war crimes transition strategy that ULIX helped to prepare, the answer could be found there. But in simple terms, number one, the resources must be avail made available to, uh, to the SPRK who handle the war crimes prosecutions. It, unless there are a sufficient number of prosecutors and resources, such as analysts, investigators, etc., available to conduct uh, and to examine these files, there will be little progress to be made. Secondly, there has to be some progress on the question of regional cooperation because, again, uh, our local counterparts will confront the same problems which both UNMIC and ULEX confronted, uh, inavailability of witnesses, inavailability of defendants. That has been addressed to some degree uh, by the proposal to amend the criminal law and to allow trials in absentia. But um, as you may be aware, this issue was examined by the Venice Commission recently yes. in June, and uh, as was the opinion of Cos of, of ULEX, um, their opinion was that trials in absentia should be uh, the exception rather than the norm. 
And that if it is, in, exactly. in, if the router becomes in, in absentia, sufficient safeguards must be put be in provided place. In, yeah. um, so that's only one way of doing it. But for me, uh, resources and regional resource, adequate resources and regional cooperation is the answer. Which we go back again to the political willingness, exactly um, to the Kosovo well, assembly and governments exactly. in order to and provide. Not just the Kosovo government, but the governments of uh, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, and so on and so forth. And I was at a regional conference last year in Bosnia, and uh, it, the, the message that was given to us that while there was great expectation a number of years and great promises by local governments to do more, unfortunately the reverse has occurred and regional cooperation is worse at the moment than it was 45 Before. years ago. Yeah. Then we'll go to the last question okay. and it's regard to the last developments with regard to the special chambers. In public we, ha we saw last week uh, some harassments which had been made by the special prosecution Obviously, the special chambers in in Hague. We saw also police officers from ULEX who kind of supporting logistically the mandate of the special prosecutor. Among lawyers, among public in Kosovo, there were kind of dilemmas. What is the role of ULEX police in Kosovo? So some of them even considered that their mandate is illegitimate, or they have no legality how to say mm -hmm. to exercise the functions. It would be good for public to provide us how it functioned police unit in ULEX, <coughs> which is composed out of 95 police officers, which is their mandate, and how they support Kosovo institutions, but also the special court. Okay. Well, I think you need to go back to uh, 2012 for the publication of the Dick Marty report, which effectively uh, alleged that crimes were against international criminal law were committed. As a result of that, the EU passed a regulation um, and it was agreed that there, would be the special, that, that there would be a special investigative body set up. That initially yes. was the SIFT. Yes. And That's in course. 2014, um, uh, when ULEX was renewing its mandate, a special provision was put in the letters of exchange <coughs> signed between Kosovo Press. and the EU to permit um, uh, Kosovo, ULEX Kosovo, to provide support to this independent body that was being set up to carry yeah. out this investigation. So uh, Kosovo, in, that, in those letters of exchange, committed to assist in the investigation and committed to assist ULEX in its support role for this investigation. So this was the first document, of this, and this was an international agreement, which effectively foresaw uh, a support role for ULEX in assisting the special institutions. In the 2014 uh, letters of exchange were brought into law in 2014, and it now became law, the law of Kosovo that ULEX should support uh, the special institution. Um, in 2000, later in 2014, the European Union brought in a regulation mandating ULIX to carry out a support role to these special institutions. Um, with, the amend, with the change and amendment to the Constitution of Kosovo in 2016, um, the special court was set up and it began its work. And so ULIX began to, to assist it in a support role. Uh, initially, its support role was, was confined simply to some logistical support mm -hmm. in that regard. Gradually, over the, year, the years, as, as investigations have progressed, that support role has moved from simply logistical to, to operational, operational and support. And uh, moving then, fast forwarding then to last week, um, when SPO came down to conduct uh, the arrests as, 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 as directed by the specialist chambers, ULIX, in accordance with the agreements, in accordance with the mandates which it had received from the EU uh, and approved by uh, uh, the Kosovo government in the letters of exchange, it carried out its support role. It, did not involve, it was not involved directly in the arrest. Um, it was simply providing a support perimeter uh, as security for, for, for the SPO staff. And that's 
but it will, it will continue to provide a support role uh, until such time as the activities and operations of the SPO are concluded. Mr. Flynn, thank you very much. You're very welcome. We appreciate your cooperation. Thank you. Shikos në ruar kas kishim kohë për këtë emision. Ne jemi duke u lumtuar këtë teme dhe matutje dhe në emisionet e artshme do të trajtojmë sërish këtë tem të ndjeshme për të informuar publikun se qëfar po dhe prohet për të zbardur krimet e luftës për të siel drejtësi për viktimat e krimit. Gjithju që këni vrejtje apo sugjerime mos hezitojmë të nashkruani në adresën ton elektronike dhe në emisionin e radhës nga unë Betimus Liu, mirëmbetëshim.